So here we are beginning chapter two in our Zimmer and Emlin textbook on evolution. And before we jump into the depth of information that we're going to cover about uh, evolution, this chapter gives us some background into how the idea of evolution came about and the transformation of ideas as we learned more and more about the natural world. Uh, of course, every idea that we have in science or biology today has predecessors. Uh, they have sprung from earlier ideas. And so it's really interesting to delve into the history of any big ideas to help you understand the big picture. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, is to get a sense of the history of how evolutionary thought developed, uh, who were some of the major players or people that were involved, and what were their contributions and ideas. So let's get going. So you might already know something about Darwin, and certainly this chapter talks a little bit about Darwin and his voyage on the Beagle. Uh, the ship that sailed around South America that he was the ship's naturalist on. By the time he got to the Galapagos Islands, which is the iconic place where, you know, people say he developed his theory of evolution, uh, he had already been incredibly influenced by things that he had observed as a naturalist in, while he was in South America. They spent several years in South America. And so he was kind of primed, you know, already to be starting to think about evolution. Uh, but, you know, this quote is kind of telling, uh, the finches of the island are so tame that they will let you hold them in your hand. That's not uncommon for animals that have been evolving for a long period of time on islands without uh, natural predators. It's not unusual for animals to lose their sense of fear of humans or, you know, potential predators. So even that right there is, you know, sort of an example of how at least the birds, the finches on the island had been evolving since they'd been isolated there. Now, these questions, these two questions are there. Um, if we were to be interacting right now and talking right now, I'd intend to ask you about these. But uh, in the early 1800s, it's discussed in, in your book, how old did naturalists think the earth was? Um, well, by the early 1800s, millions of years, uh, old but um, not long before that you know the prevailing uh, view was that of the church that the earth is only a little over six thousand years old and of course that would make it impossible for evolution to give rise to all the diversity of life but geologists in the 1700s had been accumulating data and information about the earth that was leading them to think that the earth is much older than that. So uh, the time frame was cranking up by the early 1800s. And the explanation for the origin of species was uh, divine. You know, God created species as they are, and they are unchanging. So that idea can, goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks that uh, we might see here in this chapter. So let's take a look from the beginning and see how these ideas developed. So yeah, before Darwin, uh, and he was born in the very early 1800s. Um, before him, naturalists, of course, pondered, you know, what were the patterns of nature's diversity. So it was a period of discovery to document uh, the diversity of life on Earth. And uh, in fact, it was a very noble thing to do as a scientist because you were documenting God's creation. But that was a big question in naturalist minds is what's out there? and wanting to document that diversity, explore and discover and report. And then pondering and wondering, how did these patterns come to be? Uh, what are their origins? Uh, what are their causes? What are their mechanisms? So this is how scientists are thinking in the scientific revolution. And that applied to nature as well. 
So people's minds were primed for changing their ways of thinking as new evidence was coming in to uh, indicate that divine creation might not be the best idea. In fact, I had a pause there, so I was trying to get the uh, second bullet to show up. Uh, the ancient Greeks, Greek philosophers, conceptualized what's called the great chain of being. And uh, I have something else here I'm going to click to it. So there we go. And the great chain of being was this idea that God had created everything as it exists today and it's unchanging. It's perfect. Uh, what God created is perfect. But what we see uh, existing are actually reflections of God's perfect image of the universe. So that's why we have flaws and imperfections, because we're just like cookie cutter stamps of the actual divine perfect blueprint. And the great chain of being argued that um, life is arranged in a hierarchical ladder of perfection with lower life forms like plants being down on the bottom of the perfection ladder and animals being higher and in the animal world humans were at the top of the great chain of being so these were some of the early ideas now by the middle ages and the renaissance this great chain of being idea was adapted to the Christian view of the cosmos. Uh, and it was viewed as a divine plan established by God at the creation. So basically, Christianity adopted the Greek view. And it was part of the Christian dogma the great chain of being was. So one of the first naturalists who comes into the story now uh, in terms of evolution is Carolus Linnaeus in the mid-1700s. So you have an idea of the time frame here. And uh, we'll talk about Steno or Steno on this slide as well. But Linnaeus devised our nested hierarchical system of taxonomy that we still use today to some degree. So you learned that in biology, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Good old Linnaeus invented that. And of course, that was extremely important at the time because scientists around the world didn't have a common agreed upon set of names for the different types of life forms on the planet. Everybody was calling things by their own languages from their own cultures. So Linnaeus used the common languages of Latin and Greek that scientists tend to, to learn and base the names for the groups of uh, life uh, in Latin and Greek and gave us a way to communicate and talk about biology, the diversity of it. So now he had the idea, inherited the idea that God had created all these groups and that he was just doing his work to discover them and name them. So God created the mammalia, God created the amphibia, and God created all the bigger and smaller groups outside of those. And he was just naming them, doing his duty. So let me click on here. Uh, yes, he believed that life's diversity hadn't changed since the biblical creation of the world. So again, adopting that idea that um, uh, life doesn't change. It's uh, created by God perfectly and is fixed in place. Now, uh, Steno uh, is known for uh, his fossil sort of discoveries and talking about fossils. So he uh, had argued that, for example, uh, shark teeth, were transformed into stone. Now, before this point, uh, a to, uh, an object like this, a fossilized shark tooth, would have simply just been thought of as a coincidence. Like it just happens to be a tooth-like uh, object that's actually a piece of rock. 
But uh, no, he said uh, he made some good, strong, sound arguments that, in fact, these aren't just coincidental rocks, but uh, these are remnants of organisms in the past that died. So they are fossils. And he is kind of the father for the field of stratigraphy in uh, geology, the idea that there's layers in uh, geology that have different ages of things. So that's a forward moving point that would slowly lead to evolution. So we've got Linnaeus pictured on the left side of your uh, screen, your slide, as a young guy, looks like an explorer naturalist. And Steno down there is um, on the bottom. There's the shark with its teeth and so on. And uh, well, Linnaeus's hierarchy is in the upper right and uh, with the hierarchical groups. And again, keep in mind that he devised those, like I said, thinking that God created all these groups. So as we continue our temporal journey here, we enter this realm that we call natural theology. Natural theology is the idea that uh, we can study nature, that's the natural part, uh, under the idea that it was created by God. And that would be an honorable and desirable thing to do if you're a, a priest, a minister, etc., a scientist. Uh, you're basically expected to be a follower of uh, the church and that by studying nature and coming to understand nature, you are honoring God's creation. So in the 1500s, uh, anatomists are, uh, people are starting to study anatomy and are beginning to see just how detailed the structures of animals are and seeing the diversity of them as well as the similarities of them. And uh, so William Harvey is a big name who is uh, kind of attributed to this early natural theology. And uh, he was studying human anatomy and to comparing humans to other things and seeing these similarities and differences. Uh, for him, it was all a testament and most others to God's great creation. Uh, Thomas Willis is a student of uh, Harvey's. So all students are influenced by their mentors. And uh, he researched uh, animal brains quite a bit. And so he noted that invertebrates have very simple brains. You might think of a flatworm, like a planaria, just has like a cerebral ganglion, a cluster of nerves in its head. You know, a lobster has a bigger, more complex brain. You know, a fish has a bigger brain. Uh, so to uh, Willis, this was all consistent with the great chain of being, the simpler types of life that God created uh, lower down in the ladder of perfection had simpler brains. Uh, now, during this time period, you know, 1500s, 1600s, physics is booming as a science. People are learning a great deal about the mechanics of our physical world and engineering is booming because of phys the underlying principles of physics. And so this kind of view uh, brought people to start thinking about animal bodies, like human bodies as being engineered, engineered by God and saw it as, oh, this is evidence of God's design. The human body is engineered, a lobster body is engineered. Uh, Robert Hooke, you may remember his name from Bio 181 uh, or other classes you've taken sort of attributed as the discoverer of cells in the 1600s. So he was trained as a physicist and engineer and dabbled in biology. And uh, he very much um, argued that uh, uh, animal bodies, anatomies uh, are a testament to God's design. William Paley, early 1800s, uh, big influence on people's thinking. Uh, he uh, took, for example, the idea of a clock, maybe a watch that you have in your pocket, and you're walking uh, through a field or a meadow and you come across this pocket watch lying on the ground. Uh, well, you would know that something like a pocket watch couldn't 
form by accident alone. It's way too complex and complicated to just come into being by accident. So he used this as an analogy to say, look how complex an animal body is, a human body is. There is no way that such a complex thing could come into being by accident. There has to be a designer. There has to be an intelligent designer, i.e. God. So he made this argument, uh, the argument of, you know, design, and it was very influential. I mean, it's very attractive to think that. Uh, intuitively, it kind of makes sense. So, uh, yeah, he used the human eye as, as an example. There's no way you could get something as complex as a human eye uh, just by accident. It has to be designed. Well, Darwin, of course, eventually comes into the mix, and he would uh, read natural theology. Uh, he would read the book that William Paley wrote, and he was really impressed by it, very, very influenced by uh, uh, Paley's arguments. So, uh, by the way, the, the, the picture of the fly face on the bottom right, like your textbook, I think, talks about, is one of the drawings that Robert Hooke made. Um, and his investigations of biology. So Buffon was a very wealthy, rich, aristocratic guy in the 1700s. Really smart, really brilliant sort of guy for his time. And uh, he was very influenced by the sciences of chemistry and physics. So again, this was a time period where chemistry and physics were uh, exploding and burgeoning. So, uh, very influential uh, time. And uh, so he, you know, was learning. He was a very learned guy, educated guy. And based on what he had learned, he proposed that the earth had to be at least 70,000 years old. Uh, now, we know today from some very sound physics that the earth is more like 4.4 billion years old. But in Buffon's time, 70,000 years old was almost incomprehensible. So people had, excuse me, had a hard time wrapping their brain around that. Uh, but still, that was a big jump. That was a very bold thing to be proposing. Uh, he noted that living things, like plants and animals, are made up of the same kinds of particles as rock and water. You know, that's the influence of chemistry on the thinking. We're all made of the same stuff, the same kinds of atoms. And uh, so he thought then that life must originated from some of these particles coming together long ago. Uh, seems reasonable, you know, and that animals and plants arose very early in this history. And as the earth cooled from its original fiery kind of existence, uh, animals and plants retreated to the tropics where it was warmer and safer. So now he also thought that life could change. So he might be one of the first people that we would say uh, was uh, thinking about evolution. He was really off base in terms of how evolution could happen, but still his wheels are turning in his brain. So he thought there was some kind of internal mold that organized particles. What that internal mold was, who knows, but he figured there had to be something there. <laughs> Don't you love early science? Uh, and he thought that, well, if animals move or migrate to a new place, a new environment, that internal mold could modify the particles and the animal could change. So there's a glimpse, an early glimpse into going, hey, you know, nature is making me think that uh, this divine creation business might not be exactly what uh, it's been described to be. Now, the French paleontologist Cuvier, uh, he was about 30 years old in 1800, but there's a good benchmark time for us to make reference to because he's flourishing as a young scientist then. Uh, but what he's famous for is being one of the great early paleontologists, uh, one who studies fossils. 
and he was known or he was renowned for his expertise and knowledge. He was really a pretty brilliant guy. He was also a snob and very arrogant and kind of a jerk. <laughs> but um, he was amassing information about fossils. And so, for example, uh, when fossilized remains of mammoths and mastodons uh, that were collected from Siberia were presented to him, he studied them and noted their similarities to elephants, but that they were also different from elephants. They're not the same thing. And these mammoths and mastodons aren't around anymore. They're not on Earth anymore. So they represent an example, among many that he was noting, uh, of extinction. That there were species that once existed on Earth that don't exist here now. But the idea of extinction was really troubling to Cuvier and others of the natural theology uh, way of thought, because this would imply that there would be gaps left in the great chain of being that what God created to be perfect, well, couldn't be perfect if it's gone, if it went extinct for some reason. So it was troubling to people to be thinking about this in the context of natural theology. So another uh, very important and influential person was Mary Anning. And in fact, there's a movie that may be out now or coming out soon about Mary Anning. Uh, but in the uh, 1830s, she was uh, famous uh, as a fossil collector. She came from a very poor family living in England. And as a hobby, she would go and collect fossils from uh, areas that they knew she, they occurred and sell them. It was a way to make money, uh, but also, you know, making great discoveries. And uh, so she found some really important, profound fossils, including the first um, uh, ichthyosaurs or plesiosaurs. Here's a plesiosaur uh, depicted on the bottom of the slide, an ancient reptile-like creature that lived in the ocean, a remarkable fossil. So she's another person who gets a lot of credit for the discovery of fossils and uh, their presentation to science. So realize we've been talking mostly about natural theology and some discoveries that were being made that kind of might seem counter to that. Here we're shifting gears and looking at geology, the field of geology, and how some ideas were developing there that would influence thinking about evolution. That's the big point. So Hutton in the 1700s, late 1700s, uh, was a Scottish geologist of great renown. And, uh, you know, data was accumulating and so on. Observations include uh, accumulating. So geologists are realizing that rocks form very slowly. Um, and things like erosion, wearing away of a mountainside or hillside, uh, uplift the rise of uh, mountains, okay? And tilting, you know, blocks of a rock that, that literally tilt over time. Uh, these are very slow, gradual processes that if we just stand around outside, we're not gonna see them happen to any great degree. But these slow, gradual processes uh, lead to large-scale change over large periods of time and hence we see great valleys and great canyons and big mountains and so these are enormous landmarks that change slowly and we get large-scale change over a great deal of time so he was making the big argument that the earth must be very old hundreds of millions of years old so that's really rocking the boat in terms of uh, uh, thinking about divine creation. And in the early 1800s, his ideas were accepted. I mean, when enough data and evidence comes along, it gets kind of hard to reject things. So there's Hutton up there on the top. And uh, let me click down here. Uh, William Smith, he was English, lived in England. And given the, the date of about 1820, he was a canal surveyor. He was employed 
to survey England, uh, Great Britain, the island, uh, because uh, canals were going to be built for uh, transporting water across the landscape for agriculture. So it needed to be figured out where should the canals be built? Uh, where are the best places to dig to put these canals? So he's a geologist um, and uh, was employed to do this. And so as he worked, as he worked to survey England, he noted that the same fossils were often found in different areas and the fossils differed by age. And so the whole idea of extinction is brought to life here. Uh, and so he is the one who's attributed and produced and came up with the geologic record. You might remember from Bio 182, the geologic record in the history of life. We've got the Cambrian, we've got the Devonian, you know, we've got the Permian, we've got the Cretaceous, we've got all these different names given to different time periods in the history of the earth. And William Smith came up with that fundamental system by what he observed uh, through his survey. So he organized the different strata, the different layers of rocks into a geologic history. And you can see a map on the bottom of your page, a couple maps that are kind of depicting what William Smith was um, discovering and how he's mapping out these different layers in the rocks, um, et cetera. So we go back to Cuvier and uh, he, said, you know, he's a skeptic of evolution and, and change and so on. So he notes the same fossils could be found in different places around the world. And so he's basically making every last gasp attempt to reject evolution, reject Buffon's evolution. And instead, Cuvier countered with this theory of catastrophism, which we know now is not true. There's no evidence for it. But it was the idea that, um, uh, okay, when we see that a particular species in the fossil record goes extinct, fine, it's gone. It's not here anymore. But new species aren't evolving to take their place. No, 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 no. There's already species that exist in other parts of the world, and they're just moving into the area where something went extinct and kind of taking its place, taking it over. And that's why we see new species, new fossils in higher levels of rock. They're just moving in from other areas. So some kind of great catastrophe caused the extinctions. And then uh, species from other areas would move in and take their place. That's the idea of catastrophism. So uh, we are now advancing and moving on this timeline about the development of evolutionary ideas. And we get to Lamarck. And he's a French biologist, paleontologist, very smart, well-renowned guy, and um, knows his stuff, works at the French Museum. Uh, he was very impressed by anatomical similarities of structure, you know, between species and uh, also the fossil record. He's very familiar with these things. And in his mind's eye, uh, he concluded that the diversity of life that we see today and in the past was a product of evolution. That the patterns that are seen in the fossil record in life today lead to the logical conclusion that life is uh, changing, is ever changing, that it evolves. But the challenge was, how does it evolve? You know, what are the mechanisms? What are the processes? That's always the big challenge when you see a pattern is to come up with a process, a mechanism to explain it. That's the more difficult part in science. But he argued that life was driven from simplicity to complexity. And it's, there's a driving force that's always causing life to change. He also thought that spontaneous generation of life was still continuing, that new life could pop into existence still, and that once it did, there would be the striving for it to change or evolve over time from simple to complex. Again, we know now that that doesn't happen, but still 
there's some elements of progress. He argued that uh, adaptations, those features or characteristics that match an organism to its environment, they are a result of what he called inheritance of acquired characteristics. So this is his attempt to explain how species evolve. And he is credited to be the first person, scientist, to come up with a, an explanation for evolution. And the blacksmith physique model kind of gives an example of what he's talking about. So during the lifetime of somebody who's working as a blacksmith and using their hammer on an anvil and pounding away, they're going to get a really strong arm and they're going to acquire that characteristic during their lifetime, strong arm. Now, when that blacksmith uh, reproduces and has an offspring, the idea would be that that acquired characteristic would be passed on to his offspring. Um, so scientists at the time thought, no, you're, you're crazy, you're nuts. There's too many inconsistencies with this theory to, for us to accept it. it. It doesn't quite make sense. Today, as we'll learn about later in, this, uh, in our book, our textbook, uh, this kind of malleableness that we have in terms of our anatomy, uh, physical characteristics can be attributed to what's called phenotypic plasticity. And it does have an underlying genetic basis. So we'll get to that. Uh, but yeah, Lamarck was uh, ridiculed. He was ostracized from science and uh, living out on the streets in poverty. His ideas were completely rejected by 1900. Why? Because around 1900 is when Mendel's principles of inheritance were discovered. And once those principles were discovered, then Lamarck's ideas of uh, uh, inheritance of acquired characteristics is out the window. Uh, inheritance is made possible by units of inheritance particles which we know now to be chromosomes so now today we have this field of epigenetics which you're probably familiar with so lamarck's ideas have kind of come back up raised their head again because changes in the dna of a mother like methylation of dna that might regulate genes that can be passed on to offspring and they can show the same gene regulated effects so epigenetics isn't quite the same uh, as what lamarck is talking about but there is some element there of something that's acquired in the lifetime of an organism can be passed on to its offspring so now we get to Darwin. Now, the title in your book is The Unofficial Naturalist. Now I have early life, dot, dot, dot. There's quite a bit of detail in your book about Darwin. Just want to get at some points here that jump out at me. So his early life, his father was a physician and um, he had a brother, at least one brother. Um, but uh, so he grew up in a wealthy, you know, sort of well-to-do family. And so uh, he, in his early childhood, very much spent a lot of time outdoors and came to love nature and be intrigued and curious about nature. And so he was sort of grooming himself to be a naturalist from his earliest years. Now, at the age of 22, imagine that, some of you are about there, I would figure, uh, in 1831, he was invited to be the companion to the ship's captain. Uh, the ship's captain was uh, Fitzroy, Captain Fitzroy. Uh, and Captain Fitzroy um, was managing the HMS Beagle, the ship that was going to set sail for South America and spend time sailing down the coast to map the coast of South America to get a better idea of its topography. And so Fitzroy, as was kind of a tradition, would want a companion for the voyage because he doesn't want to schmooze with all the lowly sailors. And um, uh, Darwin was kind of handpicked 
So they went to South America, spent a lot of time there. So while they are mapping the coast of South America, Darwin is going out on journeys into the continent and uh, traveling into rainforests and across savannas and prairies and high up into the Andes uh, in the mountains of South America and collecting lots of plants and animals and fossils and making observations day after day and loading up the ship with all these things. He also had Lyle's uh, first volume and he got the second volume on the voyage of his books uh, that talked about the theory of uniformitarianism, the idea that, that geologic processes are constant throughout Earth's history. And so while he's seeing all these observations on South America and seeing all this diversity of life and how there's similarities and differences, and then he's influenced by this idea that the processes of geology are consistent over time, he starts thinking, well, maybe life is changing. And maybe there are certain principles in biology that exist today that can explain how life changes. And those principles that are operating today should have been operating over the whole history of life. So if we can understand what's happening today, then we can understand what's happened in the past. So his mind is really changing. He started off the voyage very much being um, a natural theologist. You know, he you know, believed that God created everything as it is, but now he's changing his mind. So when they got to the Galapagos Islands, this was in the latter part of the voyage, uh, they weren't there for very long, a few weeks, but he, you know, observed and collected some critical data, uh, Galapagos finches, uh, flightless Galapagos um, cormorants, uh, Galapagos iguanas. And he noticed that these animals were very similar to things that he saw in South America, but they're different. And each island in the Galapagos seemed to have its own species. So he started thinking about common ancestry and change, that these things look similar because they came from common ancestors. And they look different because there's some process or mechanism that causes these species to change over time. So his wheels are turning and this is what he would come up with, his theory of evolution to explain these observations. There are similarities among life forms, but there's also unique differences. So the voyage finished by 1835, it was a long time near the end, and by 1837, he had kind of worked out his ideas, um, but he continued to refine them and amass a great amount of data before he shared them with the world. So eventually Darwin would share his ideas with the world, but that didn't begin until almost 1858. Uh, here was Alfred Russell Wallace. He's depicted in the upper right of the slide as a young man and then a much older man. Uh, and uh, Wallace was greatly influenced by Darwin. Uh, didn't know him personally, I don't think, but he was like 20 years younger. And, you know, when Darwin came back from his voyage on the Beagle, he published a book about the voyage of the Beagle. And uh, he published scientific papers about his observations and discoveries, not about evolution, but just new species and new fossils and new kinds of things. Wallace loved it. He ate it up. He wanted to be like Darwin. So he explored in the uh, rainforests of South America and he traveled to Indonesia, to the islands of Indonesia. And he was observing and documenting many of the same kinds of things that Darwin was, the, the similarities and differences among species. And he started to think that evolution would better account for all these facts. So he came up with a theory, an explanation for how species change over time. And it was basically natural selection. Now, Darwin had figured out natural selection many years before and was kind of hanging on to it. Uh, so Wallace sent Darwin a paper that, um, so Darwin received this paper from Wallace uh, and Wallace, uh, you know, it's like sent it through the mail 
and uh, said, hey, Charles, I've come up with a theory to explain the origin of adaptations. I'd like to publish my theory, share it with the world. Will you please read my paper and see what you think of it? You know, give me some editorial. Well, Darwin is horrified because he had worked out natural selection many years before. And here was Wallace conceivably scooping him. Uh, so, you know, Darwin's uh, in, uh, shown on the bottom of the slide, uh, kind of a middle-aged guy and then an elderly gentleman um, down on the bottom. But Darwin went to his uh, friends and colleagues, including Lyle, the geologist. He was a friend and mentor. And they all decided the best thing to do would be for Wallace and Darwin to present their paper on natural selection together at a scientific meeting. Uh, in the presence of other scientists. So they did so, but nobody really cared. It didn't make much of an impact. So then Darwin decided, hey, I'm going to publish everything that I've been working on. I'm going to publish my great book. And so he did. And the evolution of uh, the origin of species by means of natural selection, as depicted on the bottom corner. And, you know, there are many impacts that this book had, but one of them was that it established that evolution could be studied scientifically. He presented an incredible amount of data to support his arguments, an incredible number of facts. And so it was made clear that we can study evolution scientifically with all the facts that are before us. So now we're at this historical point where evolution is now understood, the basics, the fundamentals, and uh, the world now knows about it. And instead of the scientific community freaking out overall and ostracizing these guys, the book was so powerfully uh, influential and well argued that for the most part, science was now transformed and people are now thinking differently about the natural world. Ah, I didn't mention Darwin's uh, Descent of Man book. I was just about ready to go to the next slide. But that was another book that he worked on later after the origin of species, specifically about the evolution of humans. And I think it was in that book that he uh, may have proposed the idea of sexual selection. So there are a lot of other contributions that Darwin made, but of course his Origin of Species book is uh, what he's most famous for. So there are two primary contributions uh, to Darwin's theory of evolution, two separate ideas that are part of it. And the first one is common descent common descent. We can say it's one of Darwin's greatest achievements. It certainly influences the way many of us think about who we are and where we come from and everything, all life on earth. And so using the patterns of nature, what is out there, what we can document, anatomies, behaviors, physiologies, but at the time anatomy was the big one and the development of embryos that uh, all these patterns in nature consistently show that all species are related. They are genetically related. They are genetically tied together. And later species come from earlier species. And so this is the idea of common ancestry. It's often referred to as the theory of common ancestry. And uh, so all their species are related. So homology, homology is this idea, this concept that if species show similarities, then those similarities must come from a common ancestor. That's homology. Similarities are due to common ancestry. So on the right-hand side of the slide, we've got the forearm of, um, you know, a bat, uh, a seal flipper, a human arm. And what we see is, uh, they all have the same bones. They all have a humerus, radius ulna, carpals, metacarpals, very consistent. So why do they have the same bones? They inherited them from a common ancestor. Uh, now this, of course, was extremely different from the prevailing idea because the prevailing idea was that God created these things this way. So that's the big thing, sort of an archetype. That's what the A-R-C-H abbreviation, an archetype. So 
Uh, differences in adults might be as profound as initially thought. So they might not be as profound as initially thought because the idea there was when we look at embryos and embryonic development, we can see that many animal embryos are very similar to one another. We start off the same. And as we develop embryonically, we start to see the differences accumulate. Now we know now you've learned genetic regulation and so on, turning genes on and off. So um, we understand a lot better how we start off with a common looking embryo and then end up with something different. So on the bottom of the slide, yeah, showing uh, embryos and showing uh, patterns of blood circulation that are common. There's common patterns in anything from a shark to a human. Uh, so very, very different way of thinking, but with the same body of facts. So I went ahead and jumped to natural selection. Now, this was the other component of his theory of wow. evolution. So one component was that everything's related uh, via common ancestors. And the other component is that the differences among species and the special adaptations that they have come from a process in nature, a mechanism in nature that he and Wallace called natural selection. So this is very different from the prevailing view because the prevailing view is life can't change. Life is stagnant, if you will. So both Darwin and Wallace found inspiration from an English economist by the name of Malthus. 1798, Malthus published a book. And in that book, Malthus talked about how, um, using the example from uh, humans, and that people in poverty, uh, poverty exists because of overpopulation, that there are limited resources. And if there's too many people and there's not enough resources, then there's going to be a struggle for existence. And so not only do humans have the potential to overreproduce, but all organisms have that uh, potential. So it's not that Malthus was arguing that. He was talking about humans, but uh, biologists could take Malthus's idea and say that, well, geez, the world isn't overrun by overpopulating organisms. There's like limits to this. You know, there's things in nature that are preventing that. So that influenced Darwin and Wallace because part of the theory of natural selection is that there's a struggle for existence, that there's limited resources in the environment and organisms have this potential to overreproduce. So there's a struggle for existence. And that's one of the big components in natural selection. So you can see that on the top of the diagram. Fact number one, all species have the potential to overreproduce, but their populations tend to be relatively stable. We see that, fact number two. And fact number three, natural resources are limited. So this figure is really spelling it out in, in greater detail than what we've seen before. And so inference number one, uh, even though more individuals are being produced than the environment can support, we still see populations remain stable. So there must be a real fierce struggle for existence among all those organisms in a population. And only a part of that population can survive. Only part of that population can reproduce. So fact number four, no two individuals are the same. There is variation, keyword, variation. And fact number five, much of this variation is heritable, which is a fancy word for saying it has a genetic basis. So with those two facts in place, there's genetic variation and it's heritable. We now get to inference number two. <clears throat> with that struggle for existence, that inference number one is laying out and the fact that organisms are genetically different from one another, Inference number two says only those organisms that are best matched to the environment will be able to survive and reproduce, and they will pass on their genetics for what works. Those organisms that aren't matched to the environment, well, they're going to die. They're not going to reproduce. Their genetics won't be passed on. 
That is natural selection. That inference number two is natural selection. And it's a result of those facts up above. Inference number three is just saying that if natural selection happens generation after generation, we're going to see evolution. We're going to see a population evolve. There we have it. This was one of Darwin and Wallace's profound contributions, is providing a mechanism, a process that life could change. We now had a way for evolution to happen. Now, in Darwin's book, he had a whole chapter about how humans do this, how humans have taken plants and taken animals like pigeons and dogs and other things and caused them to change by selecting certain organisms with traits that they liked and allowing them to reproduce and pass on those traits. And what do we call that process? It's not natural selection. It's artificial selection. So artificial selection simply has the component that humans are making the choice about who survives to reproduce, not nature. And in fact, nature isn't making a choice. It just happens. But artificial selection. So here we are near the end of chapter two, and we get to Darwin in the 21st century, because this is where we are. Uh, now, I kind of mentioned this just a little bit earlier, but one of Darwin's contributions, I think it was published in 1872, was The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And in there, he investigated how humans evolved, and he explored how mating behavior could shape evolution, like check out the beetles there. The males are fighting with each other, battling over who gets to have sex with the female. And, you know, these uh, kinds of behaviors could also shape the way species evolve. So this would lead to sexual selection, which is a spinoff of natural selection. And we'll get to that in a later chapter. So there's that. Uh, but then, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Sorry about that. Can't start this over. So um, heredity was a crucial element of Darwin's theory that was absent when he published his book. Uh, pe people knew that there had to be some element that's passed on from parent to offspring, but they didn't know what it was. And so that provided, a, that was a big gap in understanding that made it difficult to accept some of Darwin's ideas because there were conflicting thoughts about how heredity works. But uh, around 1900, when Mendel's theories were, uh, of inheritance were discovered, then genetics took off like crazy, and chromosomes were understood, and the role of chromosomes in genetics, and uh, that was the 20th century, and then evolution had a strong, strong foothold. And so both genetics and evolution took off and started advancing like crazy. In the 1940s, there was an event that we called the modern evolutionary synthesis. And it was in the 1940s that all many different fields in biology came together and said, hey, we're all ultimately studying the same things about evolution. And maybe we should be integrating and collaborating with each other to have a greater uh, synthesis of understanding about evolution. So fields like uh, genetics and fields like uh, anatomy, comparative anatomy, uh, fields like uh, behavior, animal behavior, fields like paleontology, like fossils. They're all people, experts are looking at each other and saying, hey, evolution is the common thread that's helping us to understand all these different fields that we're engaged in. Uh, we need to be collaborating and integrating our discoveries more to get a better more complete understanding of evolution. And of course, now here we are today in the 21st century and evolutionary uh, uh, evolution is greatly advanced with our molecular techniques to be able to get to the nitty gritty of what's actually happening at the level of genes and nucleotides. So we've come a long way in a few hundred years and it's really mind blowing and remarkable. And your textbook is kind of a testament to that being this uh, grand synthesis of information, big ideas that we know about evolution today.
So that's it for chapter two. Chapter three will talk about the history of life to some degree, and that will be coming next.